Hi everyone, this is the Brassic Gamer. And shocking though it is, today's video has some gaming related content. We're going to be looking at the XFX Redeon HD 6870. But not just any 6870, this is the Black Edition. Now, this is a label which has been abused a bit over the years and is supposed to indicate superior performance to its vanilla counterparts. So we're going to find out if it deserves to carry the title. I actually bought these two cards three years ago from eBay to replace two extremely loud HD 4850 X2s. The Black Edition was £46 and the standard version was £30. Launched in October 2010, the HD 6000 series codenamed Northern Ireland was the last to be based on the Terrascale architecture and the first to be exclusively AMD branded despite their merger with ATI occurring four years earlier. Competing with NVIDIA's GeForce 500 series, it featured AMD's Ifinity multi-monitor tech, stereoscopic 3D and DirectX 11 compatibility. This 6870 has 32 render units, 56 texture units, 1120 shader units and 1GB of GDDR memory. The GPU is clocked at 940MHz with the RAM running at 1150MHz. Let's take a look at the hardware. True to its name, the card itself is very much black in its design with its twin fan cooler. Flipping it round, we see the PCB is also black. The side view reveals a heatsink that has not one, not two, but three copper heat pipes. The XFX logo in the gunmetal IO shield is a nice touch. It's not really all that different from the stock version, albeit with its single fan and less beastly heatsink. But at least it hasn't got the blower like the original 6870. One nice surprise was that the previous owner hadn't peeled the protective stickers off the Black Edition's fans. It's a bit weird that XFX have stuck these random bits of plastic on the fans though, Obviously to obscure the manufacturer's logo, but why they haven't put their own logo on is a bit of a mystery. There is a noticeable difference in the resistance of the fans on each model, something that we'll find more about later on. Before we fire up these bad boys, we're going to check the thermal paste, and the intact warranty stickers tell us this hasn't been done before. So we'll remove those screws, two from the IO shield, and a couple from the other end of the card. With the heat sinks off, we can see the paste on the stock heat sink is quite dry. The stock heat sink looks fairly standard, while the black editions is significantly larger. The paste is also quite crusty on this one. Here we can really see the differences between the two heat sinks. The stock 6870 has obviously seen a lot of use, with fine dust covering most of the PCB. The black edition on the other hand looks almost unused. We're just going to use a soft brush to remove any dust from the PCB and heat sinks. Yes, that was a kid's paintbrush I was using. And yes, this is a baby wipe. Who knew children could be useful? There's really no need for anything more complicated here as we're cleaning gunk off metal. Once the old thermal paste is removed, we can use an eraser to clean off any remaining debris, which really makes the copper shine. lovely. Next we clean the surface of the die super carefully and once that's done it should shine like a mirror. Aside from probably having improved voltage regulation the black edition also has slightly different RAM 
which has tighter timings and can run at 1.6 volts. Time to get this black edition in the test rig and see what it can do. I'm running an Asus Crosshair 4 Formula motherboard with a Phenom X4955 black edition, overclocked to 4 gigahertz. We're going to put this card through its paces with some games from around 2009, which was a very good time indeed for PC gaming. First up, Assassin's Creed 2. This game runs really smoothly at 1080p with a detail maxed out, consistently achieving 40 plus frame rates. Not you! He's there on him! Wow! You're actually not as big an idiot as you look! Next, we've got a title known for its high demands, GTA 4. The game does run in full detail at 1080p, but the Phenom 2 CPU is clearly a bottleneck. The 6870 isn't even being fully utilised. I know most people complain about anything less than 60 frames per second these days, but I grew up with DOS games, so 25 frames per second is fine with me. Keep him occupied. I need to get behind him. Much more impressive is Batman Arkham Asylum, which is pretty much locked at 60 frames per second, with full detail at 1080p. Keep away for this little piggy. These old gargoyles should be able to support my weight if I grapple up with it. Stop! Zaz is down, but not for long. Got to get close and take him out. Someone put this animal back in his cell. The 6870 really likes Resident Evil 5, producing 100 plus FPS consistently during gameplay. One of my all-time favourite titles, Burnout Paradise, ran quite well on my 4850, albeit at sub-high definition resolutions, so it's no surprise to see 60fps at 1080p on this card. Given the pace of this game, any stutters or pauses in frames are much more noticeable than in some other titles. Call of Duty Black Ops is another title where the gameplay can really suffer without silky smooth frame rates, but the 6870 doesn't disappoint, averaging just under 60 FPS with a detail maxed out. The monster of Megadeth! I'm glad you're a friend, Sergei. Why the frame rate overlay is absent from Dead Space I don't know, but this sci-fi survival horror plodder delivers very high frame rates at 1080p. All you have to do is get used to the slightly janky controls and you're good. The 6870 starts showing its longevity with Bioshock Infinite from 2013. This game really is a feast for the eyes, with enhancements for DirectX 11. 
Running here at full detail, 30 FPS never looked so buttery smooth. I was super impressed with Outlast, also from 2013, which still looks good today thanks to its suspenseful gameplay and moody lighting. It's locked at 60 frames per second, which is what you want to see in a game where running away is important. The benchmark for Sniper Elite V2 is a very good looking one thanks to DirectX 11 support and it delivered an impressive 50 FPS, albeit at medium detail. GTA 5 brings us right back down to earth however, it's still one of the most graphically impressive titles out there despite being released on the PC back in 2015. It does really test the 6870 mostly because of the 1GB VRAM, limiting us to a resolution of 1366x768 and medium detail. It's still technically high definition and manages a respectful 30fps so given the choice between playing this at this res or not playing it at all. I'll take what I can get. Hey, I ain't got time for this crap. We must of course ask, can it run Crisis? It most certainly can if the benchmark is to be believed at very high detail and in glorious 1080p. Being a fan of Roll Cage from back in the day, I had to see if I could get it to run Grip from 2018 to round us off. It does run at 1080p, but with the detail down to medium and barely managing 20 frames per second. Despite this, it still looks very impressive and is pretty playable despite the meager frame rate. So far so good, but how much better than the stock version is the Black Edition? Looking at GPU-Z we can see that the stock clock is 40 MHz slower at 900, while the RAM is 100 MHz slower at 1050. This results in a bandwidth of 134 GB per second, compared to nearly 150 GB on the Black Edition, which is about a 10% improvement. But does this produce a noticeable performance difference in reality? If we compare scores in 3D Mark Vantage, there's a difference of 64 points, which is less than 1%. Oh. Very now. Let's look at some games instead. Frame rates in GTA 4 are close enough that the naked eye wouldn't be able to tell the difference at all. One more example I looked at was Sniper Elite V2.
The cards look inseparable, with the final result showing a difference of barely more than one frame per second. But it turns out I was looking in the wrong place. One thing I noticed when gaming with both these cards was the noise they make. The fan on the stock card gets noticeably louder when it's under any kind of load, and if it's loud enough to be noticeable, it's loud enough to be annoying. Speedfan tells us the stock 6870 runs at about 1830 RPM at idle. Fermark has a useful stability testing mode, used with caution, so let's put it under some strain. So far it's not making that much noise. Leave it to warm up to 70 degrees however, and it's audibly clear that the card is working hard. Now let's do the same test with the Black Edition. For starters, the fans idle at about 990 RPM, thanks to there being two of them I guess. And this is what the card sounds like in its relaxed state. When we start stressing the card, it only takes 10 seconds or so for the temperature to increase to 70 degrees. But there's no noticeable increase in noise at all. Let's compare them side by side. At idle, under load, at idle, under load. Even at 90 degrees, this card barely makes a fuss, even though I could cook an egg on it. Out of curiosity, I overclocked the card even higher to see what it could handle, bumping the GPU to 980 MHz and the RAM to 1180 MHz. Again, I used Fermark to do a quick comparison, and it shows that the higher clocks deliver 97 frames per second versus 92 and that's a 5% improvement, but I'm not sure the higher temperatures are worth the risk in the long run. Reviews from the time were positively gushing, however, with overclockers describing the HD6870 Black Edition as one heck of a card, and based on the small price premium over the stock edition, a no-brainer. Tweaktown, meanwhile, used a group of 72 cards as comparison and found the Black Edition to be sixth quietest and awarded it 95% and an Editor's Choice Must Have award. So what does Black Edition mean to XFX? Apparently it means they'll deliver a pointless overclock, but they'll make sure the fan isn't bothering you while you're imagining higher frame rates in your games. This card was $219 in 2011 when it was released, she was $10 more than the Noisy Edition, and that's a pretty small price to pay if you consider acoustics to be important. Now these two cards do work in crossfire mode, but so few games seem to support it properly that it's just not worth the effort, and I'd have been better off spending my £76 on a single card solution. But hey, like many of you, I'm drawn to technology that seems cool to me, and that is what makes this hobby interesting after all. Thanks for watching, see you soon.